will go on and invite our second speaker, uh, Professor uh, Carlos Ferreira. And um, uh, I will, be, before I invite him to, to start his uh, presentation, I would like to, to read a very short bio. Uh, Professor, Professor Carlos Ferreira is chair in wind energy science at the Delft University of Technology working in the fields of wind, wind turbine, rotor and wake aerodynamics. His, he researches um, 3D unsteady aerodynamics applied to new wind turbine concepts and rotors. Professor Ferreira is the lecturer of the courses rotor and wake aerodynamics and wind turbine air elasticity at TU Delft. He has published close to 100 scientific articles on wind turbine aerodynamics and promoted several PhD, PhDs and MSc students on the topic. He is the head of studies of the European Wind Energy Master Program and program director of the MSc Aerospace Engineering of TU Delft. Professor Ferreira also chairs the Science Communication Committee of the European Academy of Wind Energy. Dr. Ferreira received his PhD cum laude from Delft University of Technology in 2009 in vertical axis wind turbine aerodynamics. So um, uh, we, um, we welcome uh, Professor Ferreira in, in our, our workshop and um, I I want to add that uh, that I uh, I personally appreciate a lot uh, uh, Carlos' efforts to to be with us today, and I thank him for for this. And please, uh, Professor Ferreira, the floor is yours. Uh, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I also have to thank you for the kind invitation. I've never been here today, but also before uh, Corona. To be there with you in Mexico, and I hope uh, when things get better, I'll be able to accept it and uh, even provide a longer lecture. Uh, so today, I have prepared <coughs> something on vertical axis wind turbines, which is one of the topics I research. Uh, can you see my shared screen? Uh, yes, but we see it in a, a edit uh, uh, form. If you display it in, in full screen, please. Can you see it still? Yes, no, 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 okay, it's perfect. Definitely. Thank you. So uh, when I got the invitation for this uh, talk, uh, the idea would be to discuss about uh, research that we are developing that considered that are relevant for vertical axis wind turbines on the spirit of identifying possible points of common interest between our two institutions for uh, further cooperation. So I tried to uh, squeeze as many topics and ideas I could in 40 minutes. If I go a bit too fast, please let me know. I'll skip the bios. Uh, uh, by the way, I sent the, I've sent you the presentation now. So afterwards, the PDFs will be able to share with the audience if they will be interested. There are three things that I would like to discuss with you today. Basically about the motivation for the floating for the last turbine. Then to talk shortly about examples of aerodynamic performance calculation for the last turbine to dispel some rumors or some misconceptions. And then to uh, present some of the examples of the research that we are doing to Delft uh, on for the turbines and why we are doing it. So if we think about the history and the possible future of wind energy science and engineering, we can consider uh, seven different ages. So the classical period that goes from 600 to uh, the end of the 19th century, where the wind turbine development were basically advances in mechanical engineering, uh, not only from the aerodynamics and structural dynamics, but also even transmission on the gearbox, that was a very important factor. 
Then uh, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, we have the advent of the electricity and the wind turbines were protected already in the, uh, on the forefront of the production of the, of the electricity, especially in, in lo local grids. And there we already start having that, that you have the conversion from wind power to electricity. Now with the aerospace age, we start to improve the aerodynamic efficiency of wind turbines. We start to have actually theoretical models for rotor aerodynamics and airflow aerodynamics, and we get closer and closer to the famous path limit. Uh, and that propels the development of the aerodynamic or the space age wind turbine. The next big step that has actually allowed the appearance of reliable multi megawatt wind turbines is between 1975 and 2005, when we start to introduce the concept of turbulence and, and uh, into the aerodynamics and also control the materials. So the idea of fatigue, and we stop trying to do a wind turbine as a sophisticated aerospace machine. So not trying to produce a Formula One uh, car, but we actually start to develop the wind turbine on the concept of a tractor. So reliable, uh, long last operation with low maintenance, large scale, uh, tough and rough machine. When this reliability uh, as achieved, we were able then to focus on driving the energy costs down by upscaling and by, and by improving OEM. So getting that the cost of energy and cost of the turbine gets closer and closer to the cost of materials and limited cost of, of, of production and serial production with my blades, towers, the cells, etc. Now we are on the in the on the part of wind farm and integration. And Antonio has a, a brilliant introduction to that topic today. So that we are talking about fleets of wind turbines and, and not only for producing energy, but producing also ener other energy vectors <laughs> and in cooperation with other systems. And this will, is going to keep us busy for the next decade and forward. And soon we will start to uh, reach the point of um, capacity, not only in terms of electricity capacity, but also in terms of space use usage, not the seas, not all hours to put wind turbines. So we'll be starting to uh, having larger and larger turbines, more densely packed, uh, operating in more uh, complex environments. So we're starting to have these very large and flexible 3D active actuator systems, like robotic systems to extract energy and converting loads. So until now we have relied mostly on the horizontal axle turbine co uh, concept. We are now operating on the 12 to 50 megawatt scale, rotors of about 220 to 230 time meters. And we soon will have the 20 megawatt scale and now we're starting to study how to achieve the 50 megawatt scale and uh, which rotors are for 300 times 400 meters diameter. The key challenge of upscale for horizontal device is uh, they have a high center of mass. So the, the higher cell and drive strain in the tower to achieve it means that the, the center of mass gets higher and higher. And higher. And this high center of mass starts to become a design driver for the support structure, the bottom mounted or floating. They also become then uh, more complex and more expensive to install and to maintain. And gravitational loads start to become a key design driver for wind turbine blades and the mass of the blades, and therefore the mass of the system. They are uh, the, the energy and conversion principle of the North South Spring Turbine is based on the actuator disk, which is excellent if you have unidirectional wind. But now you are going to be uh, going through several uh, heights of the atmospheric boundary layer. So the variations of wind direction will become 
more and more uh, uh, relevant, and you will also be immersed on uh, wind farm uh, flows where you have larger gradients of uh, uh, wind speed and wind direction, which will affect the performance of this machine. So you, we might want to explore different concepts as we try to scale up. And as we try to scale to very large machines for floating, it might be that the concept of the vertex wind turbine proves to be more cost efficient and more effective for large scale implementation. And when we're talking to about cost efficiency, we're trying to get very large reductions, so about 30 to 40 percent cheaper to justify a change of technology because the cost of wind energy keeps on going lower and lower very, very fast. So for any technology to be a significant alternative, it has to have a massive drop in the total cost of energy. So uh, a cost of energy of 30 to 40 percent reduction has to, cannot be achieved only at the water scale, especially because it plays on vertical turbines, then below they will have to be at the total mass of the rotor, but also on the, on the total mass of the support structure, on the installation costs, on the, on the maintenance costs, but also on the wind farm performance and on the density of the wind farm. So these are some of the comparative drivers of what people try usually to look on advantages and disadvantages of vertex wind turbine versus horizontal wind turbine. The most <coughs> uh, obvious that people will address is uh, for the vertex wind turbine, yaw sensitivity, the low center of mass, easier, easier installation, uh, less components. Well, that depends if you uh, want to put uh, uh, active pitch systems on the blazer map, but definitely you know your system. Uh, and uh, also, invariability or, or low sensitivity to wind direction with a height and less gravitational, uh, the effect of low gravitational loads. You do have a, a larger variation of the load of the cycle that got, that uh, does fatigue is relevant. On the other side, uh, that also means that when you do have turbulence, the tur the added fatigue to turbulence becomes less dominant. So you kind of pay in advance the cyclic loading by the cyclic operation of the vertical wind turbine. Now, what uh, usually people don't talk about possible potential for the turbine, and we'll try to explore this, is the fact that if the horizontal turbine makes it to the active cylinder, uh, active disc, I apologize, the vertical turbine creates a 3D active cylinder, and I'll show that in a few seconds. And this 3D active cylinder might allow us to do uh, both weight deflection without loss of focal area. So you can put more wind turbines and wind farm together, and also damping uh, motions into, to, uh, for example, floating wind turbine. I'd like to take a few minutes just to talk a bit about some of the more known aerodynamics of different types of plants. So here we have the result of a simulation of a two dimensions of the plastic turbine. On the left, we can see the induction fields. So how much does the flow is decelerated by a plastic turbine when we look from the top? The dash circle represents the path of the blades. The flow is coming from the left. Obviously, dark blue region is our wake. Uh, which is the process of, uh, which represents the consequence of the extraction of energy. We have, as the blades rotate, they pass the flow twice on the upward half and on the downward half, and we will have blade vortex interaction. But what you can also see on the, uh, the angle, on the field on the right, is a large variation of angle of attack 
over the 360 degrees of rotation of applied experiences. So this means that we have a large variation of loads, and we also have to design a blade to operate over a large range of angle of attack, which has an impact on our airfoil design and blade design. <clears throat> so. Now, uh, before I mention the idea of the actuator zone, so here we have a simplification of the vertical axis turbine. So in figure A and B, we have a three dimensional vertical axis turbine with three blades rotating about around the center axis. And, and on figure B, we have the 2D view of the mid plane of such a rotor. Now, when these blades rotate, they create a force field, a force field that is normal to the cylinder, to the 3D cylinder or in this case to the 2D cylinder, and also the gentle forces along the, the, the line of rotation, or, or, uh, uh, along the circumference of rotation. These normal forces are the, uh, what is responsible for extracting energy and momentum with the flow. With the big advantage of a vertical axis turbine compared with the horizontal is on the horizontal we have only one plane. So, but here we have a circle. So it means that we can play around with this force distribution. So if you look here at the figure D, which is more easy, we could think about increasing the loads on the upwind half, or increasing the loads on the downwind half, or even creating loads more perpendicular to any direction, more increasing the forces in y direction or negative y and x and z without ever, ever, ever to rotate the rotor or without changing the total shape of the circle. So we still keep the same frontal area. And this is what allows us on a vertical axis turbine to have more degrees of freedom for flow control. Now, the next step is how do we create the cylinder? What kind of shapes? we use to create the cylinder of forces. The most common forecast of turbines are all variations of these three concepts, the H watt, the Darius watt, or the V vertex and turbine. Now the H watt is the most simple concept. It is a straight blade. It is basically the extension of this, this 2D uh, concept into uh, 3D by extrusion. And here we have three, uh, three, uh, the, the, the radius is constant along the line, the, the height, we have loop effects, and the aerodynamics vary span wise, but mostly will be almost like a 2D problem. They are very nice if you want to put uh, pitch actuations or any kind of systems, they allow you to have a uniform geometry of the blind or almost uniform. Now, the, the, the other concept, the Darius for task combined, is driven by the idea of making the blades very light. The, the blades is from the Poskian shape, this almost uh, rope-like shape, uh, f uh, allows us to keep most of the stresses in the tension direction of the blade and having a very little uh, flapwise moments. We'll still have, we'll still have edgewise moments, but we'll have very little flapwise moments, and thus we can have lighter blades without any significant loss of efficiency in the total area of the wood. The V for turbine design is a, a modification of the age. And here, what he's trying to achieve is maximizing the area uh, swept by the rotor by blade length. And this V shape or the U shape would allow for that. It also allows for a reduced size of a tower. You could even consider uh, no tower and having all the moment here inch at the root of the blade and exploring again the, or even having tension cables uh, located. So this will create a cylinder. This will create a composite cylinder and this will create a conical cylinder surface. 
as we can look at some of the concepts that have been explored more recently, I won't make the history, but to see what people have been looking at. So this was the Nufort concept. This was a French company who actually built a, a, a one-third prototype, which is on the figure on the which is on the right. And what we'd like to discuss here is how some of the challenges of the fertilizer design drive the shape. So the original concept that we can see on the top left was to create an helical rotor so that there would be a smooth loading on the generator and a smooth loading uh, on the, the thrust. But then, and they actually built the first part of the rotor on their prototype, so the, the blades have this angle, they would enter the most upwind region at different phases. And then the, the I can point at this in terms of production of the blade in terms of very elastic behavior, very elastic stability, started to be too challenging. So the next concept was very obvious. Straight blades. But here, in this case, we will be putting two turbines on the same floater. And this will be that the two turbines will be counter-rotating to decrease the total amount of torque on the floater and more lines, and also to have a two turbines in proximity and reinforce each other efficiency. And then they rebuilt their rotor with straight blades and they tested. And they were active until a few years ago when they ran out of, well, one of their financiers uh, failed and they had to chip on. But they did build a, a working uh, demonstration prototype. Uh, these are two different studies. These were only conceptual studies. One was the S for Water Touch project, and here was about the scaling and dimensions of the floater to overcome the turbine and demonstrate how much floaters could, are lighter uh, uh, because of the low center of mass and the overcast turbine, even if the rotor is heavier. And, uh, and we demonstrated that and we also explored the effect of uh, pitch control, uh, because pitch control becomes an important uh, design feature to de decrease uh, extreme loads. And here on the right was a deep wind concept. A deep wind concept is a floater where the generator is underwater and the tower is, uh, and the tower in the underwater floater are rotating in, in the water. And the idea is that uh, the water then becomes as one of the bearings of the, the system. And uh, also for survivability and maintenance, you can just tilt the full rotor down. So this is a concept like for minimal, minimal, uh, minimal systems and maximum simplicity. So I want to explore with you what is a theoretical performance of a vertical capsule device? This is just the uh, very simple calculation, very simple model. So imagine that you have a three bladed vertical axle turbine and we'll set it up for a 10 megawatt scale. And I'll take you the dimensions of the DQ 10 megawatt reference wind turbine. So that one has a 178 meters diameter, the outer size wind turbine. So if you want to do that with a vertical turbine that will have aspect depression one by one, then you'll have 158 meters height and 158 meters diameter. The blade cord at about 3.7 meters and the wind speed at 11.4 11, 11 meters per second. Now, if you calculate the performance and look at CP and thrust, you will have things that will be very similar to what you will find on the horizontal turbine in terms of maximum CP, maybe a little bit lower, but it'll be something around 0 0.51, 0 0.0505 in terms of maximum aerodynamic CP at a thrust of just slightly more than 0 0.8. And this is very similar to what we we'll look at on the turbine, but then we, we try to decrease a little bit of the thrust and then with losses, uh, additional losses, usually for horizontal turbine you'll have uh, an aerodynamic efficiency of, uh, of uh, around 0.47. And for the vertical turbine, you also, if you 
decrease a bit the loading and you have, uh, just say, uh, less effective airfalls, you also have, will be at the same kind of scale, so 0.47, which afterwards you have to apply the losses of your generator. Now, this would mean that you have about, in terms of aerodynamic power, about uh, just over 11 uh, <coughs> megawatts of, of, of aerodynamic power that would be possible, but more effectively would be around the 10, 10 10.7 megawatts for a thrust of about 1.5 uh, megawatts. So this is to dispel the idea that the forecasting turbine is somehow aerodynamically more limited. It is more difficult to achieve and you have, uh, and depending on the shape of the rotor, you have uh, uh, trusses and struts to deal with. So there are, there is, yeah, should I say, there are more opportunities to lose efficiency, but it's not dramatically more efficient. And that is not the key driver of the design of the cost of energy. Now, an important topic is uh, when you have, uh, the psychic loadings, they will appear, of course, in your thrust. So in our three-bladed wind turbine over the rotation, uh, so over one period, you'll see one, two, three peaks and three values on your thrust. So you have this variation of CP and, uh, of course, the same variation of thrust. And you can see it can be here around plus or minus 10, 15 percent of loading on every cycle. And this has to be accounted for, it has to be designed in terms of the fatigue of the machine. So I hope that this gives you a little bit of an idea, <coughs> of, an idea of possibilities or uh, some of the drivers that we are looking for when we are thinking about the vertical axle turbine as an alternative, alternative to the challenges of upscaling the orthodox turbine and the challenges of putting the uh, orthodox turbine in a floating machine. Now to support this in Delft, we are doing a lot of research on bots and uh, 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 sorry, this, this is the research that I'm working on. And of course, mostly based on the rotor, rotor technology and our dynamic elasticity. So I like to just afterwards choose a few of these points to explore with you, but we can divide them in two levels. One, the air elastic rotor design, and the other one at the aim for a high power density wind farms. In terms of air elastic rotor design, which is worked on our air form design and test, 3D rotor design modeling and testing, load, flow, and weight control. 3D acid aerodynamics of floating wind turbines, aerostatic stability and loads, turbine twin flows, aerostatic digital twin. And we try to demonstrate this in our wind tunnels that we are all for. Then, uh, uh, in terms of uh, high wind power or well, high power density wind farms, weight control and deflection and mixing for various wind turbine weights. Weight growth interaction, uh, wind farm air, uh, aerodynamics, integration also with the filter in terms of dampening of the motions, um, and uh, again to demonstrate a more wind time. So I'll try to take four or five of these topics to give a light and some pretty pictures since that also is right um, The first one in terms of airfall design. So, can we, I'll just quickly jump back over. If you look at again the air for the what is the angle of attack that they fall experiences of the rotation, you'll see it spends a lot of time here on the maximum angle of attack. About let's say here, 10 degrees, for example, in broad this region, and a lot of time during the uh, minimum angle of attack. And then intermediate it passes this region very, very fast. So if you look at this distribution, we'll spend around 80% uh, on this region on that. So 50% around here, another 40% on this region. So 
contrary to what you do of designing an airfoil and applied for most of the time, where you are operating on a very limited range of angles of attack or for an aircraft, you now have to design a blade that will operate very well in this region and equally well here. And the consequence of this is that you have to choose uh, the aerodynamic consequence of this is that you have to actually tend for airfalls that tend to be thicker instead of being very thinner. And so they will have a very high structural performance of so these optimized airfalls from the last week of So there will be on the axis of structural performance will be very high. But if you properly design, you can still have a, the, the same kind of high aerodynamic performance. You can still achieve to the theoretical power coefficients above. 51, 53% of the power for the rotor. So we can look for this design space now that we understand and we can actually define theoretical functions to what should the perspective uh, of the performance of the airfall uh, be. And we have done that and we have actually designed. And then afterwards, we have actually built two of these airfalls. It tested in our wind tunnels, and then when we test them, we also try to test them in pitching conditions and the acid conditions and the conditions of dynamic storm <coughs> to, um, to verify the, the, the performance. And I'm, I, I do apologize if I'm using a lot of aerodynamic jargon. I'm not totally sure uh, the scope of the audience. I, I am trying to follow the, the request. Uh, on the invitation, but I, 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 I believe it was more for the people that are specifically working on this topic. For the rest of the others, I hope I'm not boring them too much with this specific jargon. Now, uh, the same way we do with, with 2D airfalls, we also try to do with the 3D water design. So, this is our, uh, we have built several. Regressive by models, this on wind tunnels. This is our pitch mod, which it has uh, one half meter by one and a half meters, I think nine meter. And what is special about this compression turbine, besides being instrumented with strain gauges and measure the loads, is that each blade can pitch, change the pitch angle over the rotation and individual, so that's individual pitch control. So it has here the actuators. Uh, here, but a representation of the machine. So here next to the tower, each blade has its own actuator with a small band that connects here to a, to a bearing, which pitches the blades. And we can easily have plus or 10 minus degrees pitch variation over one revolution. And the machine works at about three and a half to four hertz. And we, and we use it to test this, these ideas of modifying the heavy load control for power control and for weight deflection and for mixing the weight. What we also do is that we instrument the machine to get the deflections and the loads and we try to create aromatic digital twins to basically to, to have a digital twin of the machine to further study it and also to study the stability and loads, uh, both the structural um, uh, loading and, uh, <coughs> and model analysis, but also the impact on aerodynamic loads and uh, to try to identify if we find any limits of the stability of the machine. What we use with, the, with this pitching and load control allows us is again to do load flow and weight control. So here we have a simulation of this pitch for glass wind turbine. Uh, and what we are doing here on these two cases, case A and case B, is on the top case, the blades are do not pitch, they are rigid as they rotate. And on the second case, we have a 10 degree sign uh, out the face with, uh, with azimuthal position to create a side force. And the result of this side force is that we are then able to deflect the weight. And the objective of the defect in the weight is if we be in, and we get a defect, of course, in any direction, 
uh, is that if we have the ability to deflect the weights of all the turbines, we can start to put turbines closer to each other without being dependent on the natural remixing of the wake. And thus we can have more and more uh, uh, wind turbines in the same wind farm. This kind of approach is also research and attempted on horizontal wind turbines. But on, on horizontal wind turbines, the way you do to deflect the wake is to yaw the rotor to create the side force. So part of the rotor becomes uh, a lot like a gyrocopter. Uh, and that uh, that yaw angle and that side force is what deflects the weight. The problem of that is that you are increasing the fatigue loads of the machine, but most importantly, you are decreasing significantly the frontal area of the first turbine. So you are significantly decreasing the power performance of the first turbine because pri primarily you are. Uh, reducing your ability to extract energy from the flow because you decrease the projected frontal area. For the for the vertical turbine, the cylinder remains a cylinder and the only energy penalty is the cost of energy of deflecting the flow. So these are simulations and uh, to go with the simulations, we also are now developing the experiments uh, with the large scale fish water also with smaller scale turbines, which allows us to put one behind the other and start to do uh, studies, both experimental and on CFD of uh, the development of the weight, the mixing, the deflection, the energy uh, that the different turbines will experience in the wind farm. And so this uh, on the right, we can see the CFD results. And, uh, and here, for example, is a preliminary result of the study of the weight. So this is with the, what's called helium filled soap bubbles, particle image of symmetry. It means that we make very tiny soap bu bubbles filled with helium. We release them in the flow. We shoot a big laser to them. We take pictures of the particles, of the laser being reflected from the particles and we track the trajectory of the particles and we use that to rebuild the flow field. And then we can see the shape of the wake and its strengths, its velocity field, its vorticity and its deflection. Um, last, because I think I'm just hitting my time. Uh, last, um, this is a new project that we are part of. We are the you know, second partner of a project which is by the University of Strathclyde. It's called the X Rotor, it's an horizon 2020 project, so uh, financed by the European Commission. And this is a very funny concept, I, think, I like it very much. It is a vertical axis wind turbine on an X shape. So it's actually a U shape, it's two U shaped vertical axis wind turbines. And the idea is that at the tip of the rotor, you put uh, an horizontal axis wind turbine to convert the power. So it means that there is no central generator, there's only a, a, a bearing here. Power. So, uh, well, Uh, uh, Carlos, are you are you with us? Uh, are, are, are you with us? Uh, it, it, it seems to me that it's intermittent, so uh, I don't know whether we are going to be able to take uh, questions. Um, but um, uh, one thing, uh, Osvaldo, if you if you agree with me, perhaps what we can do is to try to invite people to um, make questions. Uh, through the sh through the chat, so that uh, yes. Carlos, Carlos can take can can read them, and if um, if uh, uh, there is um, there's also a possibility if Car Carlos agrees 
that uh, we can uh, make uh, questions through the email after the after the, the presentation is uh, stopped so that um, so that somehow we can uh, um, uh, satisfy our curiosity regarding some of the uh, points uh, in the in the presentation is that is that agreeable to you carlos yes i was actually answering on the chat that uh, that's both fine with me okay let's see if uh, if there are um, if there are questions through the through the chat um, Roberto Dominguez asks well you can you can read the question can't you uh, Carlos yes I can okay um, if we have made the yes so even uh, the question is if we can result analysis of the RNN behavior of wind turbines in the presence of fluctuating wind and uh, the question is yes uh, actually, by last question, uh, Antonio and I we just finished supervising a master's student on a vertical axis uh, wave rotor that is in motion. So it perceives a fluctuating uh, water speed. So what uh, David is asking is about what is usually called dynamic inflow and how vertical axis turbines perceive dynamic inflow which also might be relevant if when you have the different numbers of blades and there might be some phase locking. So we, we have that. We have also tried to develop um, some dynamic inflow models for vertex wind turbines. So we have done explicitly with vortex methods, methods where we can actually change the wind speed. And you see the effect, you see, you see the damping of the loading. Uh, and we have also done that to improve uh, study models like that with a single model. And we have tried to do it experimentally on the wind tunnel we showed you with the pitch rod by uh, putting a gas generator in the wind tunnel. So something that will change the wind speed very, very fast. So on the order of uh, several Hertz uh, and so that we can uh, um, study this effect, and it is relevant, a relevant effect. It is also very relevant for the case of the floating wind turbine because uh, with the floating motions, one of the consequences you will have is this appear, apparent uh, dynamic inflow. So David, does that answer your question or does it touch what you were interested in? Okay, um, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, yeah, um, Roberto, uh, answers to your question, yes. <laughs> it okay, has been brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, And um, is there any other uh, question or comment? I, oh, there, there we go. Uh, Oscar Martinez Alvarado, uh, well, you can read the, the question, please. Yeah, yes. Uh, so thank you, Carlos, for a very interesting talk. Well, thank you, and sorry once again for the technical issues. You probably mentioned this, and I missed it, but can you say something about the sort of range of wind speeds in which a vertical axis turbine operates? Is this the same as the horizontal axis turbine? Yes, so uh, the range of speed of an horizontal axis turbine is totally based on the cost model. Uh, now, as they grow larger for uh, uh, lower power generator, a power they even operate in speed, some of the some of the NOS operate by three and a half meters per second. And the vertical wind turbine has no physical limit of speed where you want to optimize this is going to be from 3 to 25 I'll come back to it and then they another question can you tell us about the chance of low power for PhD was on that topic of uh, the first class 
provides for urban cities. The biggest hey. Carlos, I'm, advantage I'm, of Rutas and turbines for quiet. Carlos, I'm sorry, I don't know if this is happening to, to everyone, just me, but I I can't I can barely hear you. This is uh, uh, this is real bad. So if we can ask you the questions through the email and so that you can have all the time to to answer them if you if you need uh, because um, this this is uh, very very difficult it, eduardo is it's fine and also i i won't i don't want to take more time i also want to hear and uh, I'll, I'll answer the email thank thank you thank you very much and before anything happens i i want to to um to express our uh, gratefulness for your for the efforts in presenting uh, your your talk and uh, to being uh, with us we do appreciate it and it's unfortunate that um, we had this um, this had this uh, uh, technical issues but uh, nevertheless i think that 95% of your of your talk was properly uh, uh, heard by by us so please um, react to um, to Carlos' presentation and um, we we hope that this is not the last we the last time we interact Carlos thank you very much for for, for your um, for your talk. Mm -hmm.